Hey everyone, welcome back to Barger Hordes. My name is Robert. Happy Friday. Uh, happy birthday to Britta. If you don't follow Britta's channel, you should. I'll leave a link to it below, but today is her birthday. Um, things are getting weird. Last night, I had the most intense, bizarre dream about getting a haircut I've ever had. In fact, in my 60 trips around the planet, I don't think I've ever had a dream about a haircut before, but uh, five months without one, I'm starting to figure out how mullets happened. Um, and so I guess that's what I'm dreaming about these days. So I, I read an article recently that says that people in quarantine are experiencing much more vivid and strange dreams. And I'm, I'm starting to believe that's true. The only news I had to report to you is just kind of a reminder that we're two weeks away in the BookTube Prize from announcing the finalists. The six finalists for fiction and nonfiction will be announced on the 31st. So if you've been following along the prize, be on the lookout for that video on the BookTube Prize channel. Uh, in my own reading this week, I finished one book and almost finished a second book, which has been about typical for me. I am not reading nearly as much this summer as I read the rest of the year. I think once I finished the last of the 48 books that are still in competition in the Book 2 Prize, um, after I guess they were the, the quarter finalists, um, once I finished those 48 books, I lost a little of my momentum going back to pick up the books that had already been eliminated. I'm still doing that, but not nearly as quickly, and I'm not reading nearly as much each day. Um, but I did finish one, and it's a book that was on my video uh, back in March on my 70 by 70 video. Uh, I came up with a bucket list of 70 things I'd like to do in the coming decade before my 70th birthday and a good dozen of, of them were books that are considered classics that I have not ever read. And Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier was one of those books on that list. And um, I'm not convinced it's going to hold up as a classic like other classics have, but I can understand why it's so popular. Um, it's romantic, it's mysterious. I don't think I need to recap what the story is about. Most of you have either read it or seen uh, the movie version of it. I have not seen the movie. I'll probably watch that at some point. Um, and I enjoyed it well enough as far as a thriller or a slight mystery goes. I don't think it lives up to the hype for me, however, that it seems to achieve on BookTube. Um, I am usually pretty bad at being able to predict plot twists in mysteries and thrillers. And most of what happens in this book was either signaled by the author in a way that you couldn't miss it, or I was able to predict what was going to happen next, and I was right, even though I went into it not knowing what the, the story was about. Uh, so that I, I found a little bit less fulfilling than if I had been taken by a, a, a huge wow moment. Uh, and also, I. I was a little disappointed in the really kind of a, a let down final chapter. Uh, I just didn't think much of the way the book ended. Um, so while I enjoyed it, I think I gave it four stars on Goodreads. I don't think it lives up to the hype that I expected from this book. And so it was enjoyable reading. I'm glad I did it. Now I can at least understand what everybody's talking about when they talk about their love for Rebecca. But it's not a book I could see myself going back to reading again. Um, so for me, it was just okay. The other book that I'm reading now, and I will probably finish this weekend, I feel like I've been reading it forever, is Cantoris by Carolina de Robertis. And it is one of the octofinalists from the Book Two Prize that didn't advance to the quarterfinals. Um, and I'm not going to say too much about it until I finish it, although I will say that I'm enjoying it more than I expected to. I didn't know much about it going in, and from reading the, the book jacket at the beginning, I thought, huh, oh, okay. Um, 
but I, I've enjoyed the writing style. I think it's losing steam a little bit in the second part. The first part I thought was really compelling. And very quickly, it's the story of five young women in Uruguay. It starts off, part one is in the uh, late 1970s, 1977 and 1978, which is about five years after the, the military coup and the onset of the dictatorship in Uruguay and dictatorships in general in South America. Um, and these five women uh, are lesbians and have either discovered each other through romantic entanglements or discovered each other through friends at a time when LGBTQ plus is just not accepted in the country and you'd be thrown in prison and tortured for it. And so they're, they're very much trying to discover their own sexuality without being discovered by the military and thrown in prison for it. And so the book starts off with a, a, a trip the five of them take to a very remote fishing village, almost on a, a spit of land that no one even knows is there, and how they become very close friends. And then the rest of the book is the aftermath of their lives from their trip. Uh, and that's the section I'm in now is in the 1980s. Uh, we've gone ahead a few years and it's gonna go, I think through, this section goes to 1987 or so. And it's what the different women have experienced both in their personal relationships and in struggling against society's expectations and family expectations too. And so I'm enjoying it. Um, it's right now it's heading for a four star rating from me. Uh, I do think it's losing a little steam in the section I'm in right now because I don't find myself as anxious to pick it up as I was in part one, but it's still, it still exceeded my expectations, uh, so I'm very happy with that. The book that I have up next is a nonfiction title that was also a booktube darling that wasn't necessarily a critic's darling, and that is The Five by Hallie Rubin, Rubenholt. Um, it's the story of the, the women victims of Jack the Ripper, and that's the extent of my knowledge about the book. But readers of this book seem to have really enjoyed it way more than the critics did. Um, in fact, it wasn't on my original nomination list for this year's Book Two Prize, but enough judges asked for it to be added that, of course, I added it, and it made the, the field of 48. So it had a lot of weight with some judges. So that's up next for me. Uh, I'll probably start that late this weekend or on Monday or so. As far as my movie project goes, I watched two movies this week. Um, I told you a couple of weeks ago that I've been kind of alternating a movie and a K-drama. When a K-drama series wraps up, I watch a movie as kind of a, a palate cleanser and then go back to a new K-drama series. So the two movies that I watched this week, one is the 1927 Buster Keaton movie, The General, which I did not expect to enjoy at all. Um, when I think of silent movies, I think of you know the, the degrading picture quality, really bad piano tinny music, um, and, and dumb storylines. And while the storyline of this one is slapstick at times, the picture quality has apparently been restored. I didn't go into the history of the film, but it's obviously a, a, a re-digitized master of it. And the, the movie score of it, I think, is also new. And it's mostly featuring um, almost the military brass band style sound geared towards the action of the movie. Uh, and it's really quite good. I found that very entertaining. The story itself is a simple one. It's at the very beginning of the, the Civil War, 1861. Um, the main character is an engineer on the railroad, uh, and the engine that he is responsible for is called the General. And when the war breaks out, he jumps in line to enlist with everybody else because his sweetheart makes him feel like if he doesn't enlist, she can't see him again. And so he goes to the front of the line and when they find out that he is the engineer for the railroad, they say, no, we need you there. You're more valuable there. So they won't let him enlist. And so his girlfriend basically abandons him. They shun him as a coward and a traitor, not realizing that he tried to enlist and they just wouldn't let him. And then he ends up in, finding out about a plot from some, some Union spies to infiltrate the South by that railroad line and then blow up the bridges after their escape to keep the, the rebel army from advancing. 
and he stumbles across this plan and in doing so also finds out that his his own train has been stolen the general has been stolen by these spies and secreted on this train was his girlfriend <laughs> so he has to steal another train to track them down and it's a comedy of errors at times and it's an amazing display of physical humor and when I read that Buster Keaton does all his own stunts in this, there's some things that could have gone very, very wrong in this movie. So I was, I was very impressed, even though I'm sick of Civil War stories and I surely don't want to do anything to praise the Confederate Army. Um, the movie itself far exceeded my expectations for a silent film. And so uh, I, I would watch another Buster Keaton film before I would watch another Marx Brothers film. I just thought the sophistication of the humor was so much superior than uh, when I watched, what was it, Duck Soup that I watched recently. So that one turned out to be better than I expected. It doesn't make my top five list by any means, but it's certainly not one of the worst ones I've seen either. Uh, and then I watched last night, I watched Midnight Cowboy, the 1969 film with uh, John Voight and Dustin Hoffman and Brenda Vaccaro. And it's, it's weird to realize that all three of those actors are now in their 80s. Um, I have, as you know, watched probably four or five films from this AFI list now from the late 1960s, and I've hated all of them. Um, and this one doesn't get any better for me. It's got kind of a, an interesting buddy story that's pretty typical, uh, where two completely different people end up teaming up together, and it's got a, it's it's got its own um, tragedy at the end. Um, but it's just so strange and so gritty and dirty and disgusting and just I just didn't care. It's only an hour and 40 minutes long and after 15 minutes I was already checking the clock to see when it was going to end. Um, I, I just didn't like it at all. I just do not get along with the aesthetic of 1960s films and this was 1969 best film Oscar winner so I, I just don't get it. Um, so I was glad to have that one behind me. I had not watched it before and I will not watch it again. Uh, the one that's up next for me, according to the Random Generator, is a 1944 film, Double Indemnity, which I have seen before. It's kind of a, a mystery thriller. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen it though, so I don't even remember the plot other than it has something to do with insurance. Um, so I'll be watching that one probably sometime in the next week. As far as K-dramas go, I finished the one I was telling you about last week, which uh, Rakuten Viki, the, the website, the streaming site, calls Guardian, but a lot of people call Goblin. Um, and I thought it had 19 episodes. So when I talked to you last time, I still thought I had five episodes left. But it turns out that the last three episodes were actually just special extra features after the, the show ended. So when I turned it on to watch the last couple of episodes, it ended far more abruptly than I was prepared for and far more powerfully. One of the things that I had complained about this one to myself is that while I was enjoying it, it wasn't affecting me as emotionally as I was expecting it to. And then it all just kind of did towards the end. It got very emotional towards the end and I, I was really touched by it and it probably bumped it up from a, a, a high four-star rating to a low five-star rating for me. Uh, I think I've seen 20 or 22 series now, uh, K-drama series, and all but two or three of them have been four or five stars. So I, I've been really pleased with so many of them, it's getting hard to distinguish among, amongst them in the rankings. And then the one that I watched in its entirety was a historical uh, K-drama, uh, The Moon Embracing the Sun. And in, in the, the legends of um, more ancient Korea, the sun, of course, is the king and the moon is his queen. And it also refers to one of the elaborate hairpins. Um, I don't know how they pronounce it exactly, but it's binyeo, I think, um, that ladies at court, noble ladies would wear. Um, there was a pin made for the crown princess by the crown prince that incorporated that mythology with uh, the sun and the moon, and he gave it to her as a gift. And so that's where the title comes from. 
Um, it's set in the Joseon uh, era, which is the last dynasty before Korea's monarchy ended in 1910. And the Joseon era lasted roughly 500 years. And there's nothing in this particular drama to tell you where in that 500 year span it falls. It's a completely internalized court drama. It doesn't have to do with outside countries and historical events around the world. So there's no really way of placing it in history and it doesn't really matter. But it's, it shows the story of intrigue within the court power struggles between families for control over the throne, control over minister positions, who becomes the crown princess is down to two families that are rivals. And it's, it's all about court intrigue and murder and backstabbing and scheming and everything else. Uh, Korea has had a very interesting system um, that's different from what we think of in the West as the primogeniture system you might see in the UK, where uh, it goes down through an elaborate um, list of people who are next in line for the throne. What happens in Korea, uh, or what happened in Korea, is if the, the king were to die without an heir, it leaves an enormous amount of power in the dowager queen, the king's mother, if she's still alive, has the power to choose the next king herself. And she also has a lot of power in choosing who the king marries. And that's the power that gets exerted in this particular film. Um, so it was, it was interesting. I really liked it. And again, it was one that didn't hit me too emotionally until the last couple of episodes. And then it all just kind of compresses on you at one time. So it was another very good one. The one I started last night is called uh, Failing for Innocence, or excuse me, Falling for Innocence on the Rakuten Viki website. Um, it's listed in some other articles about K-dramas as beating again, which refers to a heart transplant. Um, it's going to be a, a romantic comedy, but also set in the power struggle among corporate um, families. And there's, there's a a struggle between an uncle and his nephew right at the beginning and the nephew has a fatal heart defect and he's in his early 30s I think and he is about to die and it's a one in a hundred chance he's going to get a transplant because of the rare condition that he has and by a weird coincidence and miracle he ends up getting the transplant. And I'm guessing that this series is going to be about his transformation as a person because he starts off as a real asshole. And you almost see from the way the characters are lining up that he's not going to end up that way. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that one plays out. So that's what I've been watching. Um, that one has 16 episodes and I, they're each a little under an hour. So I watched three episodes last night and I'll probably crank out about three episodes a day until I finish that one. Um, other than that, things here are the same. It's hot and getting hotter, but we expected that in North Carolina right now. Um, we could use a little rain, but other than that, everything's just the same. Uh, I'm now in my 18th week of my self-quarantine, and this is almost six months without a haircut, and I think the dream is a sign that I need to buy some clippers and just do the quarantine buzz and get it over with because it's driving me crazy. Um, I hate having ear hairs, you know, tickling my ears during the day um, and the hair in the back being long and, and floppy and just just horrible. So it's, it's time for it to go. I hope you're having a better week than I'm having, at least on that score. And I'll talk to you again soon. Bye, everybody.